Hello everyone and welcome back to Flight Sim 2020 where we're taking off from Edwards Air Force Base in the Dark Star which is the scramjet that was added as part of the Top Gun DLC that was free for everyone and it can go Mach 10 which is helpful in this case because we are trying to go around the world in it. I had previously gone around the world in the Concorde and I was interested to see how much faster this would be. So. We are going, initially I was planning to go from Edwards to Newfoundland, but I ultimately decided that we could go all the way to Lisbon. So there's going to be a flight from Edwards to Lisbon, and that's 4,880 nautical miles. And there we have our ascent from Edwards Air Force Base. And in order to extend our range to that length, uh, we will eventually run out of the scramjet fuel and have to go to the normal fuel mode, but that's not too bad. Even in the regular fuel mode, it can go Mach 3.75. Uh, the scramjet fuel is a hydrogen fuel, and the regular fuel is who knows what, really, but uh, uh, probably some special compound because uh, I think the SR-71 actually used a sort of special formulation for its engines, and this Dark Star is sort of like the SR-72, so it's got a combination jet ramjet as its main engines, and then there's the scramjet, which we activate at three, uh, Mach 3.7 at around 120,000 feet. I go to the maximum height allowed by the plane, which is 275,000 feet, which is the maximum height that the sim allows because the higher you go the more efficient it is. The reason for that is there's less atmospheric drag higher up. There is less air for the engine to take in but basically the drag and the less air to take in balance each other out and you just use less fuel to mix with the less air and so you get better engine efficiency at higher altitudes uh, in order to produce the same net acceleration. So, of course, there's a limit to that, and actually going to 275,000 feet pushes that limit, um, way pushes that limit. We're way too close to space, and we probably shouldn't be able to breathe air at all. But anyway, as we very quickly pass by Lake Michigan there, uh, we are making a good pace here. My expectation was that we could make it around the world in five flights. Uh, given a range of more than 4,000 nautical miles. The circumnavigation I set the parameters for, uh, we needed to cover 21,600 nautical miles, which is the circumference of the Earth, and we needed to cross the equator in this case. I would decide that we would add that as a requirement. Generally speaking, circumnavigations with planes don't require that. As we can see Newfoundland there, we were originally going to land at Newfoundland, but um, I had enough fuel uh, to go across the Atlantic. The crossing of the Atlantic was boring. This is past the crossing of the Atlantic, um, so I didn't capture any of that. And we're getting to nighttime here. There's the scramjet fuel running out. I was already descending and decelerating before it ran out, just for safety's sake. And so now you can see the rapid drop in our Mach speed, which is the top dial up there, which is now at 6.6, 6.5. And we are descending to a lower altitude at Mach 3.75 as we make it into Portugal. So landing at Lisbon and there is Portugal there as we approach and the sonic boom there. So yeah this is all during live stream and that will and this was on Twitch by the way uh, I diversify my platforms if you will but uh, yeah that will become relevant later on too but people were able to see the whole deal uh, just uh, for for legitimacy's sake. I did actually tune the ILS for once because I can't see in front of me, so that was helpful. And actually, this goes so fast that uh, you can't really see the runway on the display until it's too late. So, uh, in this case, I decided, uh, yeah, actually doing the ILS was a good idea. I did land hard all the time. Uh, that's, that's just how it's gonna be with this thing. I. I decided that was, if it was going to let me survive, I wasn't going to try and airliner this and make it easy for passengers. Uh, we, we are space people, we're used to landing hard and having our spines sh shook, so... Anyway, I didn't uh, belabor the shutdown. I tried to actually figure out how to shut it down, but I couldn't get it to acknowledge that the flight had ended in a normal way. normal way is just to shut down the battery or something, and the engine, uh, the fuel to the engines, but... Uh, that didn't work, and I did try to fuel cell as well. But anyway, that flight was 1 hour and 15 minutes to fly 4,880 nautical miles. And of course, most of the time is actually just taking off and landing. 
uh, the scramjet mode, maybe 45 minutes on scramjet, I think. My initial plot for the next flight was from Lisbon to Bombay, as you saw there, but that was only 4,300 miles. Ultimately, taking a look at how the rest of the flight would work out, I decided it would be better to fly from Lisbon to Chennai, which is V-O-M-M. -M. And that would be more like the same length as the flight from Edwards to Lisbon. So that would be 4,899 nautical miles that we're doing on this flight. Uh, so yeah, but here we are activating the scramjet again. I sort of like the dramatic effect that it has when the scramjet mode activates, like warp drive or something. And you'll notice basically what happens is we almost empty the two extreme center line tanks, the forward one and the back one, and the two center center line tanks are the scramjet propellant. And here we are on the scramjet propellant. And I believe that's Madrid to the left, if I recall correctly. And here we're going to be striking out over the Mediterranean, and we're already at Mach 10. And there's Italy, uh, Rome and Naples being the largest cities in our view. And here actually we're already over Iraq, I think, and that might be Baghdad if I recall. But uh, yeah, a little bit difficult to tell. And then finally, we come out of scramjet mode uh, just along the south coast of Pakistan. So that's how much distance we covered on this one. And there it goes. And then we actually end up taking a while on the non-scramjet mode on the jet ramjets while flying over India. So we're at Mach 3.75 over India because originally I was planning to go to Bombay, but I decided to go to Chennai instead. And I was a little bit wasteful on the fuel initially. So here we are approaching the east coast of India and I've turned on the sort of labels for other players because one of the other people watching the show on Twitch uh, decided to join me for the flight and that was Pekka and we'll see Pekka around occasionally as I land here. So in order to identify Pekka we will... Oh, that was rough. But again, I, I wasn't really very picky about the landings at all. So, forgive me, but that was not a goal of mine. And really, with the Dark Star, it's a little bit tough to decide how to land it nice. There's Pekka there. So, yeah, we will see a lot of him as we don't actually taxi. And I just uh, end the flight very abruptly and check the log. One hour and 23 minutes to go 4,899 nautical miles. So the next flight is from Chennai to uh, Melbourne and this was really only possible going from Chennai instead of Bombay. If it was from Bombay to Melbourne it'd be a little bit too far, I felt. So we are taking off and there's the afterburners. We do have to remember to activate the afterburners because it's a separate toggle. It's not just the top end of the throttle. So. I, I thought I had uh, forgotten about that once, but I'm not sure I did. There's Pekka also in the Dark Star, but it's really hard to keep up with people going at Mach 10. It's going to be tough. This is uh, just the range at which you can see each other is sort of difficult. And the mismatch between when we, you know, activate the scramjets and all that business and slowing down is not so easy, so it's complicated. And for some reason, Pekka tended to seem to go faster than me at some points. It was strange because we're supposed to be both going at Mach 10 at the same height. So tough to say. Anyway, we finally got some sunlight on this leg as we were uh, alongside Sumatra. So dawn occurred. We're going very, very fast here. So there is no possibility of avoiding the nighttime portion. And here is Australia. We are entering the coast of Australia. And it is looking marvelously rugged at this height. There we go, coasting along. And finally, we see the south coast of Australia. And we will be going along it to get to Melbourne. One idea I've had is to have sort of a continuous presence in flight sim. In other words, 
Uh, my location is sort of fixed. I don't jump around. Uh, I have to actually travel from one location to another. And in order to sort of close the gap there, because that might be inconvenient in certain cases, I would use the Dark Star to occasionally go from one place to another. After all, it's so fast. And yeah, that might be an interesting to do, just have some sort of continuity in the game. And anyway, here we are coming into Melbourne. And I was coming very dramatically. Uh, I was slowing down very abruptly. I wasn't... Uh, wanting to take a whole lot of time on the slowdown portion of this. After all, if we can cut down the time it takes to get up to Mach 10 and also cut down the time it takes to land, then we also cut down the flight time. Anyway, I was looking around for P.E.K.K.A. there. There will be more of that as we go along. And ultimately, I was not paying very good attention right about here-ish. You'll note that I'm sort of lined up with the ILS, or lining up with the ILS, and uh, but I have my spoilers out, and I see Pekka in the right window there, but I am going very, very slow. That's 120 knots and below, and of course it's going to stall like that. So that was... Well, it was instructive. Um, we have just found out something about the Dark Star, apparently. It has Kerbal Physics. Well, at least on this occasion it had Kerbal Physics. It just sort of bounced off of the ground. Um, yeah. So I got lucky there as far as survival was concerned. Uh, don't worry, it'll get, me, it'll get me in the end. But here we are landing and I was off center, but you know, on the whole, I was a little bit flustered by the whole business of bouncing. I was very much excited by this discovery and talking to chat about it. So anyway, we did land somehow safely at Melbourne International, YMML, and there you see in the log, 1 hour and 14 minutes for 4,741 nautical miles. And taking off again, this time the destination was Honolulu. I mean, obviously. Uh, it's, uh, you have very few choices for the Pacific Ocean after all. So off we go, and we got some nice clouds around here. I was enjoying the scenery after flying in the dark for a while. And here at Mach 2, I, I was for some reason very sluggish in accelerating and we can see Pekka sort of zoom by there. I didn't quite understand why I was so slow on accelerating and it seems like I had my afterburners on. but. Anyway, ultimately we get up to the speed where I could activate the scramjet, but it felt like it was a lot longer than usual. And so here we go. Uh, though uh, at least we didn't consume too much more fuel in this case. Uh, of the regular fuel, not the scramjet fuel. And there's Sydney. We see some people at Sydney there. As we fly by at, uh, I think we're getting close to Mach 10 by now. And there's Becca following along remarkably well. Honestly, I didn't think it would be easy to follow along at Mach 10. So, yep, the Pacific didn't have too much by way of sights, so I'm not going to belabor it. This is where the scramjet fuel is no longer available, and so we turn it off and start descending. And this flight was 4,793 nautical miles, so we've kept the legs fairly consistent, but the next one can't be so long because we just don't have places to go. Uh, so the next one will be only half the length, the, uh, the flight from Honolulu back to Edwards. So here we go, coming down to Honolulu. But uh, one thing to note is how much propellant I've used of the main propellant. The thing is, if you're going very fast at low altitude with the normal engine, that tends to guzzle the fuel very quickly, and so I did that on this particular flight. We used a lot of uh, fuel going faster at lower altitude, and that's gonna that's gonna be relevant soon. Anyway, so trying to line up here. The runway configuration at Honolulu International uh, is always very interesting, and I, I still haven't really determined what landing speed I want here. I mean, I don't want to land fast, but I'm landing hard here, obviously. I'm, I'm getting close to the stall speed there. I mean, it seems very slow, right? Because Dark Star is not 
the most aerodynamic thing ever, but it's also very light at this point and has no fuel. It can take off with a full fuel load and it's much, much heavier with that full fuel load than it is empty. It's basically a flying fuel tank. So the gap between its takeoff speed and its landing speed is actually quite wide. Anyway, that flight was one hour and 18 minutes or running up one hour and 19 minutes. And this is our final flight, a much shorter flight, half the length, and it wasn't quite making my 21,600 nautical mile requirement, uh, so I decided to add a little detour over Miramar. And there we go, Miramar. And so we add that detour and that makes up the, the length that we needed. So that's a 2,416 nautical mile flight. Uh, and actually it'll end up more than that because Turning with this thing is not easy. We'll be going very fast still at that point, and it's gonna be a gigantic wide turn. Of course, at Mach 10, this thing takes an entire continent to turn around, so... Yeah, we won't be going Mach 10 at that point, but we'll still take quite a lot of time. It's definitely not the most maneuverable thing, and it ought not to be, considering its aerodynamic configuration. So, we see Honolulu there. Again, good view of everything and all the peoples who were around at that point. And I actually had to hang around for Pekka a little bit because Pekka was lagging behind. And that uh, cut into our fuel, which is going to be relevant, but it wasn't the main reason why I would have problems in the end. So yeah, but anyway, we were hanging out a little bit and used a little bit more of the regular fuel than usual. And then activating the scramjet and as usual I do like this it, it, it's sort of like friendship drive in in Elite or I know uh, frame shift drive but it's sort of the same idea okay so Mach 10 and we are at full height and Pekka's hanging around and then we are very quickly approaching the west coast of California well, that's the only coast of California. Uh, so, anyway, the west coast of North America, if you will. And there's San Diego down there. You can see the regular sort of shape of San Diego. I plotted for Miramar, but it really doesn't matter because we're not, like, hitting the exact location of Miramar at all. You can see how fa far we've gone past it in order to try and turn around. I am trying to turn here, but it's not easy. I pull up a bit and pull some G's, but we have to be careful about that. This actually can't can't, uh, can't pull that many G's. Nice landscape though. Now without the clouds, sort of reminiscent of Mars uh, clouds and maybe the the roads. I mean that's very Martian right there. I feel I was enjoying that view. I probably should not have been enjoying that view. I should have been paying more attention to what was going on with the aircraft. Uh, because we are still going fast and we are now fairly low which means we are guzzling fuel and as we take a look inside again you can see my wing tanks are half empty and actually they go by very quickly within a minute it's gonna be empty and another problem is that we still have a lot of the scramjet fuel because we only made a uh, half distance flight we only uh, spent less than half of the, maybe about half of the scramjet fuel. So we're actually heavy, uh, which is a problem. So there we go. All my fuel is empty. Basically after I came back in and we had half the fuel tanks remaining, one minute uh, was how long it took to empty the fuel tanks at this speed and this height. So I don't recommend trying to go at Mach 3 low altitude with this. It does not sustain that very well. So keep that in mind if you haven't uh, thoroughly checked out the Dark Star yet. This is not something to fly around low level and high speeds at for very long. Anyway, I was still thinking I was in pretty good shape. That's why I went outside and took a look because uh, I was lined up here. You can see ILS, we're lining up. But I had forgotten one critical thing and that's that Edwards Air Force Base is actually pretty high up. It is much more than 2,000 feet and I had not factored that into my mental math when being very confident that I could get it back to Edwards Air Force Base. Edwards Air Force Base also has all these long uh, sort of dry lake bed strips and you know that gave me some extra confidence but no here we are falling way way short and we are in trouble. So we were close to Edwards Air Force Base and close to being successful with the circumnavigation but not quite and that was because of a little bit of enjoying the scenery that I probably should not have been doing and a bit of 
misestimation. We actually touched down safely, but I think we actually hit something, which is what damaged the landing gear. I'm not entirely sure uh, because I couldn't see in front of me, but anyway. Altogether, it took about six hours, and hopefully that'll be a good reference to any of you who would like to try it. I do recommend it. It's a little bit of fun, uh, though the landings are a little bit rough. But anyway, with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.